Hey there, everybody. It's Jenny Clark, and this is a special session that I call the Mitch Group. I just recorded it with the group on. They asked me great questions, and I forgot to hit the record button, so I'm going to give it again. So um, we, this is a follow-on to Freedom Friday that I call the Mitch Group. So let me switch over here, and um, we'll talk about up here at the top. Um, what we're talking about today is understanding wrap rates. Let me make sure that I'm sharing that. So when it comes to wrap rates, wrap rates are the way that we price in federal contracting. It's the way that we cover all our costs. It's the hourly billing rate you'll charge your client. It's associated with labor categories like project manager, senior engineer, database administrator, junior analyst. Usually those titles are in the proposal and we typically use average pay rates and then we use a multiplier to cover indirect cost and profit. There's different variations for this name, by the way. Some people call it a loaded labor rate. Some people call it a fully burdened rate, fully loaded rate, a billing rate. You need to be clear on whether you're supposed to do that with or without profit or fee. In the federal contracting world, sometimes depending on the type of contract, you price it without profit because they're going to do treat the profit a different way, have a shared fee, different things like that. But anytime you hear these words, your ears should perk up. Let's start with some definitions. Direct labor. What you're pricing for is the cost of your employees, not subcontractors, not, sub, not consultants. Consultants are done something different and everything that I'm talking about has to do with people that are employees. They are W-2 at the end of the year. Uh, they may have benefits. They might not have benefits. They might have leave. They might not have leave. Depends on your policy and who they are, how big you are. So you want to have a way that this could all um, be part of it. Direct labor, that is your people. So you take their annual salary divided by 2,080 hours. That's 52 weeks a year times 40 hours. That's pretty much the standard. There's also come something called productive hours or how many hours you'll bill in a year or how many hours they told you to bid. That will typically be less than 2,080 hours a year because that will be allowing for them to have some paid time off, whether it's vacation and sick leave or holiday. If I'm guessing, I say it should be take off a couple hundred hours for holiday, vacation, and sick leave, and that you would have maybe a productive hours base of 1880. Sometimes it's 1965. They change it around, depends on the contract, depends on the work schedules, where they're working, all kinds of stuff. But the annual salary to direct labor is always divided by 2080 hours because that's the basis on what you pay not the basis on which you bill. Um, you do want to consider the specific employees that meet that labor category. When you're bidding on federal contracts, most of the time they're going to say, here's what this person needs to have. Here's the skills. Here's the education, sometimes recommended or required. Um, do they have to have a, a uh, security clearance? All of those things are part of it. And um, when you're doing your calculations for proposals, you could have a mix of both the specific employees and projected new hires in that mix. So what cost do you include in a wrap rate? Uh, you include the cost of the employee pay, the employee working on that contract. Uh, you're going to have to cover their payroll taxes and benefits. That's going to include uh, workers comp, by the way. If you're offering, if they, if you have to provide them a computer or internet access, if you've got recruiting costs, human resources, payroll and billing, marketing, sales executive, and think about it. These would be costs whether you're working for federal or not, but you gotta be very specific when you're working in federal of how you break them down and make sure you're competitive because otherwise you won't win any work. Okay, first thing you wanna know about with um, your employees and how you create billing rates or wrap rates is the biggest component of that's gonna be what you pay them, right? You want to find out what the pay scales are. Where are they going to be working? It's going to be a different pay scale if you're doing California versus doing, I don't know, Texas or someplace like that. Uh, do the people have to have security clearances? Do they have to have certifications? If they're going to have certifications, most of the time you hire people that already have it, so you're going to pay a premium for that. Do they have to have cybersecurity certifications? Are you doing work that's going to require Department of Defense cybersecurity uh rule compliance. 
what are you going to pay to recruit them? What's going on in the industry? Is the job market tight? Is it loose? Are you going to pay an outside recruiter? Are you going to make all the calls themselves? Could you have a sign-on bonus? Retention is a big thing, and it's not a big thing. Some companies know they're not going to retain people, so they pretty much say, we're going to price things in so we never have to offer anybody any 401k match because they'll never be here for five years. They'll never get vested. But when they're hiring on, they'll never think about it that way. And we'll say, so sorry to see you go, but we'll hire somebody else to replace them and play the same game again. So this is a very complicated fun game. Uh, career paths, some companies are looking for people that can be on retained, be on a career path that'll be part of a permanent team. And that means they're pretty much going to work closely with you for a long time. And you're probably going to have to have a location associated with that and all your clients in that location. So these are a lot of things to um, consider, but it's all going to be part of, you know, what makes you special as a company? What benefits do you have to offer? Well, typically holiday and leave are the first two components. There are some contracts that come out where you they have to be called Service Contract Act, where your non-exempt employees have to be guaranteed um, certain holidays, certain values for leave, seniority for their leave, and even 56 hours worth of holiday um, a year, or not holiday, sick leave. Um, there are some that come out that where there's a competitive bargaining agreement, and if you were going to bid that, you need to get a copy of the CBA competitive uh, collaborative bargaining agreement um, to find out what their benefits are that you have to require. But the big question mark for you is you don't know if the people you're going to end up hiring um, because many times they're considered incumbents. They already work on that contract and you're on the recompete or you're trying to win the next the next five year contract. You got to steal them away somehow, but you're always going to be um, guessing at does this person have one year of seniority which means they get two weeks off for ho for vacation or do they have 17 years of seniority and they get four weeks off that's going to affect your pricing right uh, group insurance uh, you may or may not offer um, health insurance vision insurance dental insurance you may or may not pay all or part of that, depending on what your rules are. Of course, with the Affordable Care Act, all the things that have been going on with health insurance. This is a big question mark. Health insurance will be your second biggest component of your labor cost to be thinking about. People always ask me, well, how much can I escalate my labor a year? Well, typically only two to three percent. And you're thinking, well, my health insurance is going up by 20 percent a year. How do I do that? This is part of the game. We've got to be able to play it. 401k, if you don't have a company match, there's not going to be a cost in your benefit program for the 401k, except maybe the cost of setting it up and running it. Um, and, but many companies will have a 401k match that um, is either declared every year, so it's not guaranteed, or they could have a profit sharing. There's things called safe harbor that might, might apply where you basically give everybody across the board that's eligible 3%, whether they participate in the 401k deduction program or not. Sign-on bonuses. Sign-on bonuses, you usually as a government contractor person will not be able to pass that cost on to the government. You're going to, if you pay a sign-on bonus, it's probably going to be absorbed by you because you said I had to pay that cost to get the right person. It's still cheaper to hire, give somebody a sign-on bonus than it is to give them a permanent bump in salary. So think about that. Uh, retention bonus, some, sometimes, especially for people that are deployed, a retention bonus would be for um, when they finish a year of service or whatever to try to incentivize them to stay with you or reward them for having stayed with you. Um, professional development certifications depend on what kind of area you're in. It's not the cost of the professional certification and professional development. It's that do you have to let people take time off? Do they take their own pay, take their own vacation to do it? Or do you have to pay them on overhead, which is the kind of cost that costs you money where you're paying their salary and you're not, they're not bringing any revenue that week? Um, is that part of your cost? In the commercial year world, you usually would have to do that. In the government contracting world, no. You go hire people that already have everything they need because you will not get compensated for it if you have to pay it and give them a couple of weeks off to go learn a class. Once in a while, your government customer will say, that's important enough to me that I'll pay for that person's time while they go take the tat. Uh, the, the, the certification class, but not, not always. Um, other benefits, hard to say what those might be, um, but, you know, everybody has their differentiators. What I'm seeing now is sometimes a trend of when you're bidding on a team that they'll say, well, you have to match our, our benefits. You go like, 
I have to match Lockheed's benefits? Are you kidding me? Overhead. Overhead is what makes you as a company unique. It's your technical expertise, what your innovation is, what your expert knowledge is, how you solve problems. What is it that makes your company the obvious choice? That's what goes in overhead. Overhead is your big differentiator because think about it. If everybody's bidding the same fringe package, your fringe cost is going to be the same as your competitors. If everybody's going after the same labor pool, your pay rates are going to be the same as your competitors. Overhead's your differentiator. It's got to be of value enough that you can, it's a value added, not that they're going to pay a premium for it, but that they would see you've got competitive rates, but I like this company because they do X extra. That's a value 